we are in toast A in the Discord, everyone. Uh, this is the clockwork of mechanized emotion in games, in case you are highly lost. I am Valerie Valdez, your host for the evening. Um, and I'm going to now ask my two brilliant panelists to please introduce themselves. Uh, let us first have Ali and then Phoebe. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Ali Bushim. My pronouns are she, they. I am a tabletop game designer and narrative designer. I've done work for uh, Wizards of the Coast, Paizo, uh, Green Ronin, a bunch of Kickstarter. So uh, you picked up Thirsty Sword Lesbians. I have a scenario in that about wrestling. And if you picked up Brickwood, I made the incredibly out of left field scenario for that where you are on Warped Tour, but there's vampires. <laughs> uh, and I like, I like making people sad, I think. <laughs> All right, Phoebe? Hi. Hi, I'm Phoebe Barton. I am a trans queer writer and game designer developer. Sort of, because I have written a grand total of one game, a interactive fiction interactive fiction game, uh, the Luminous Underground, that is, I that was done through Choice of Games and is up for a Nebula this year. Woohoo! And nice. otherwise, my uh, otherwise, that is my first real foray into game writing, but it is not going to be the last because. I've already started uh, doing uh, work for uh, another one uh, for an uh, IP project. That's cool. That's how it starts. Yeah. That's how they rope, rope you in, right? Um, yeah. All right. So I'm so excited to hear what y'all have to say. Uh, so we're going to dive right into the first question. Um, so for the kinds of games each of you write, uh, where do you start when you're tr first trying to figure out how you want to make your players feel while they're playing the game. Do you start character, world, plot? Do you just kind of throw it all together at once? Um, Ali, do you mind going first on that one? Yeah, um, I don't do any of those things. I make a playlist first. And <laughs> find so cool. movies that I like, and I try to build what is the mood of this game going to be. So like for some of my smaller games, like uh, As the World Ends, which is on itch, it's really obvious. It's Train to Busan. I took the framework of Train to Busan and I turned it into a tabletop game. But for other ones, like uh, the scenario that I wrote for the Thirsty Sword Lesbians, uh, the title's a mouthful. Shinsei Galactic Porrasu Revolution, The Final Engagement. <laughs> I built a playlist that was a couple of entrance themes, but mostly like what does it sound like when you're the underdog and everything has a soundtrack? So I pulled music from like Birds of Prey, uh, some from Near Automata. <laughs> and, like that that's how that playlist started. That is so cool. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just it is very cool because I think that like that is, you know, everyone comes to things differently, and that's just like that that's such a great vibe. I don't know. I love it. Um, Phoebe, so how do you how do you approach the at, at the beginning of the game? How do you figure out how you want to make your players feel? What do you do? How do you start this? Well, I mostly try to figure out the um, the general the general emotional quality that I want the game to embody, and it doesn't not, uh, it can be a definitely complicated emotion because I put a lot of myself and my a lot of my opinions about the way my city has been run uh be over the and it was written over the course of two years and i had a lot of opportunity to to file it down but it was just trying to like starting by building it around these qualities of neglect and quiet desperation and just letting though like keeping those in the forefront of my mind and letting those influence the way I describe things and how they affected the choices that I gave to the players. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. 
Um, I'm probably, I feel like I'm going to say that a lot, so I'm sorry in advance because yeah, y'all are just extremely cool and I'm so excited by this. Um, so continuing down our question list, but I think I might cycle back around to some of the stuff you just said. Um, so how do you build the emotional hooks or lures at sort of at the beginning of the game to uh, first entice the players to play, but then also as they go um, to keep them really immersed emotionally while playing? Um, we'll, we'll start with Phoebe and then Ali this time. For me, I think a lot of the investment a player will have with my game is because it is the thing with um, choice of games interactive fiction is that they are stat based and they do offer multiple like multiple resolutions to each uh, to each challenge. So players are building characters throughout it. So there is mechanically there already is that sense of players wanting to get invested in a unique character that they have assembled through the choices they've made. And so much of it is just like trying to pin emotions to the various choices so that there's kind of so that there's kind of like like an opti like um an upbeat optimistic way through or like a cynical way through and so on and so forth, interspersed with events that I try to uh used to hook uh, to hook the player's emotional interest like one of the very early things that uh, the game deals with and it's it's not really much of a spoiler because it's in the free demo is of rescuing unintentional time travelers who have been trapped in a painting for 60 years and there are a lot of uh, there's like and a lot of the emotional resonance I found was it's it's like when I'm not actively trying to put it in there, when it's not at forefront of my mind, when it's just this is the this is the undercurrent that I'm going towards. And I find that having that undercurrent set up makes things more honest because it's not I am not it's not like I am reaching in and moving the pieces back and forth. It's more like I'm doing it from under the table. Like a magnet kind of like. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's always um like players will not react nearly as well as you want the would like them to if they can tell that they're being manipulated. So the lesson yeah. is, if you're going to manipulate your players, make sure they don't notice. <laughs> uh, I I feel like that applies to like all fiction too. That's yeah. If you can see the the strings that are pulling you, it doesn't work as well. Um, so yeah. So Ali, um, yeah. How do you build in your hooks, your lures, yeah. and and those kinds um. of beats that come around? So it's harder it's, for you because you're doing more of a like uh, a tabletop because then yeah. it's like the, the players are coming up with their own stuff sometimes too. Yeah, uh, tabletop is a little bit more like I've built a stage or no, I've built a theme park that you can go through, mm -hmm. and some some things are like cordoned off, but you can't really stop a player from checking behind the curtain if they're very determined to look behind the curtain. So like uh. One of the games that I'm still working on and have been for forever, Misbehaving, I started with the premise of, I just want to play Boardwalk Empire meets Teen Wolf. And a lot of times that's how I'll start with a game. So I just started, I want to play Boardwalk Empire meets Teen Wolf. But I also want to see myself in games, which then leads to, it's the 1920s. You're black and you have superpowers. What are people going to do about it? About it, and they try to regulate you out of existence. They push you out of communities, like that sort of thing. And it ended up becoming a, I guess, like an essay on the experience of being a person of color. And then uh, I took it to Pax Unplugged, 
to play test. And this is one of those times when I could not stop a player from looking behind the curtain where um, all of the players at the table were white. And I was like, okay, so like you have this whole setup. Uh, what kind of characters are you making? And one person said, I am a mad doctor that's going to be killing people and turning them into my personal zombie slaves. And I was just like, I, I don't know how to respond to this. I technically everything you've just said is a thing you can do in my game. And like I sat with that for months and just didn't touch the game because I didn't know what to do with someone that like went that far behind the curtain, changed everything and made it into like this terrible horror that I never wanted to see. Uh, and actually the thing that got me to go back to working on it was talking to Strix, uh, who was like mentoring me at the time. And I was telling her about this experience. She was just like, you know, you could make mechanics so they can't do that. You can just make it so that someone can't do that. And it just kind of blew me away. So like finding ways to make the experience that I want people to have is mostly just about building the flavor, putting in the right kinds of mechanics, and then finding a way to cordon things off so it doesn't make that that horror horrific theme park like movie moment happen again yeah i just yeah yeah. go ahead and i just wanted to go off off, like continue on that and how like the way we build our games is super influential and how like yeah we can like like we are in charge of these worlds we can build them so that some things are possible, some things are impossible, and, or that the game has a specific opinion on this stuff. And I did put in something very, like, very much along those lines very late in the game setup process when I was, it was at the point where comments were coming in from the beta testers and there were things I had to go back and fill in. And there is one point in the game where you can, you can be, uh, you can deal with, be confronted with uh, someone who is uh, about to throw a brick at um, a politician who is very explicitly labeled in the game, like everyone refers to him as a fascist. And it's just in terms of, I was very, very particular in not only what choices I was offering the player, but what happened mechanically, because one of the, there are three choices. There are one, uh, one of the choices is, I guess, um, like do it. You try to convince the person to do it somewhere to to go punch him in the nose later when there aren't as many people around. Another one is to try to, like, suggest, I think, waiting until, uh, like, not throwing it now because you, because it could cause, like, like, a serious riot that would get people hurt in the situation because there are a lot of people. And the third option is for you to try and talk him down in terms of how, um, well, like you shouldn't throw, you th- shouldn't throw bricks at people. That one is very intentionally has a much higher score threshold to be able to succeed at. And if you do, it gives you the lowest point value achievement in the game where, which is with a description specifically almost sneeringly written. <laughs> Like it congratulates you, it congratulates you on being so much of a centrist. <laughs> I was literally about to say, congrats, centrist. <laughs> and so I guess that is like, and that's also like the sort of thing that I know would generate, like maybe generate emotions of frustration and so on in players. But that was very much the intention, because that was like. It was very much a point of if you're trying to go this way, I want to make I want to make it hard for you to succeed. 
and I want to know, I want to get this across if you actually do succeed at this, which I have tried to make it difficult for you to do. Yeah, and that is harder in tabletop, right? Because like you said, all, the most that you can do is try to kind of corral the players by the mechanics and stuff. And even and even then, it's a sort of thing where in a tabletop game, like nothing, I guess, nothing really stops players or GMs from modifying things that are in a book if they really want to. But for something like a game that's written, it is... Um, especially for ones that don't support mods like mine, it is like, it's not something that a, that a player would be able to negotiate with. So there is a, it, it, there is that um, aspect of how the structure of the game and how, how its negotiability can affect those emotional beats. Yeah. So speaking of choices, as as we just were a few moments ago, um, so games do tend to rely on player choices to drive the narrative. Even even if it's a tabletop game, sometimes you'll have built in kind of like, you know, the players can choose to go here, choose to go there, choose to talk to this person, choose to talk to this other person, stuff like that. Um, so how how do you craft choices that are going to give players, you know, the big feels? Um, we'll start with Ali on this one. Uh -huh. I can get my Twitter notifications as well. Oh no. Um, um, so crafting choices. A lot of what I do for publishers, so like for a Paizo game, is I look at a situation and I try to think, okay, how do how would I approach this if I know I've only got like these sets of stats, or I know I only have a party with this, and I try to make potential choices and guide people towards things where if someone does fall outside of that box they'll at least have a baseline to work from mm -hmm. but usually those aren't very emotional choices so when mm -hmm. i go to my own games i try to keep the same thing where it's all right i want to give people a potential baseline for the choices that they make so like in uh spitfire and straight lace which I haven't actually looked at in years because I published it years ago. Uh, you have choices for what if you're the Spitfire, the older cop that's like two weeks from retirement, eternally just two weeks from retirement, working with a new rookie that believes in the system. The choice is what corners do you start cutting to try and get your man to solve this case? Mm -hmm. So I tried to leave it pretty open-ended. You just, all you know is that you were cutting corners. And a lot of people, when they've played it, have been like, well, I'll forge evidence. I'll pick up the person that just seems to know everything in this neighborhood and try and get information out of them. And they all land at the same choices because of the word choice of cutting corners and because of media around it. So like using that influence of other media to help improve people on the box that I'm guiding them towards. That's so that's so wise. Like the word choice that you use for the choice itself causes the impact. And like you said, like then dead players are bringing in their own kind of expectations from other media. And oh, that's yeah. so cool. Um, Phoebe, how about you? Because obviously your choice of games, literally. So it's like all about choices. Yeah, and for the big choices, like. Like, well, realistically, I want to make everything, well, for all choices, like, my goal was to make things as awesome for the player as I could manage. And so it's easier said than done. I know that there are times where I didn't, where I didn't succeed, but it's like, even when it's something like, uh, something minor, because the thing is, like, when I'm doing all of these choices, like, for a typical, like, challenge, there are three paths. I typically did three paths through because like the more choices there are, the more writing there is. And each of those, each of those choices is a success and a failure. And so I can use like 
basic like I try to make something cool happen regardless but it's like having knowing how something succeeds and how something fails can influence like what happens in the other what happens in on uh, the other side of it and it's just having like being able to have a, for a deeper understanding of the consequences of success and failure for me helps sharpen things and hopefully so that I can communicate you to the player like you succeeded and this is how you did it awesomely. And even when you fail, it's like you failed, but damn, look at those sparks and explosions. <laughs> It's like you messed up, but you did it in the coolest way. <laughs> messed up with passion. <laughs> you messed up aggressively and loudly. Um, <laughs> there. That's actually, one of my favorite tabletop mechanics in Powered by the Apocalypse games. And I was going to say Blades of the Dark. Dark. Yeah. yeah. The, the idea of a partial success. It's like you, you, you aimed for the stars and missed. Or <laughs> shot for the moon and missed and landed among the stars, hopefully. Yeah. And maybe the stars are just a reflection in a pool of oil on the ground, but they're still stars, and that counts for something. Yeah, absolutely. That That is one of the things, and I think that works really well just for all writing, too, that kind of, like, you know, the the yes, but, or the no, and. Yeah, and I feel that, like, this is a place where a mechanic, the actual mechanics of what you're working in, does have a significant role, because for, um, for tabletop games, it's it's very straightforward to say like like you roll one to one to five or sorry like one is a critical failure two to whatever is a partial is a whatever but for the code i was working with it was i never figured out a way to have anything but a straight success or a straight failure because of uh, because of what it's working with and just in that situation Re relying on random dice rolls can gener can definitely generate an emotion in the player, <laughs> which is irritation and frustration, which is not the emotion I want them to associate with my game. Yeah, uh, I have definitely had that when playing Stars Without Numbers specifically, where I made this communications expert that no matter how many times I rolled to hack things or work with the computer, I always failed oh, no. if I did anything else i was great at it so i just had this like computer science nerd that could touch a computer and it would fry because yeah, and like the difficulty of a game can be like is an emotion generator in its own in its in its own right and that was something that with mine came up in beta testing because what I didn't realize, because like when I'm writing the game, like I'm not, it's not like I'm not taking a character through it. So what happened was that in purely unintentionally, but by me like increasing the success thresholds throughout the game, by towards the middle and especially toward the end, it became fiendishly difficult. And that was, it was totally unintentional. So that is like that sort of balance is a is a critical component in ensuring that you don't communicate the wrong kind of emotions because if a player is trying to succeed but keeps failing because it's almost impossible for them to get through unless they make all of the right choices they're not going to come away with a positive uh, with a positive view of it. And that is something that came up during beta test, fortunately during beta tests, so that it could, the difficulty could be adjusted to what it was supposed to be. Yeah, I'm going to like tack a question about beta testing onto the end, I think, that I hadn't put in here. I am 
it is the midpoint now, and so I will note that uh, for the audience, if you would not mind to begin starting, begin to put your questions. We are in Toast A in the Discord, and so we are. We still have more questions that we're going to continue with, but now is the time to start thinking of what you want to ask and putting it in the Discord. Um, so we've we've been talking about mechanics a little bit already. Um, uh, so how how do you use? I mean, again, you've already sort of been addressing this a little bit, but how do you use these particular game mechanics um, for tabletop for you know uh, uh, choice games, um, choice of games like you know uh, to construct scenes or segments? Because I know choice of games has kind of very a very particular like chapter flow that they have going on tabletop. It's it's definitely different and can vary by game for sure. Um, but how do you construct these scenes or segments of module just to to generate or maintain particular moods or or tensions that that sense of tension? Do either of you want to jump in uh, first or I can call on? I can jump in first. Go for uh, it, Ellie. So I've written a lot of very small things, but one of them was a small town, which is a scenario for Monster Hearts 2. And it's called All I Want for Christmas is Blood. And I, one, I probably shouldn't have been listening to My Chemical Romance quite as okay, much. Okay, but no, that's the best but... name ever, so no. <laughs> Please but continue. Just with that title, I set up the the thing. Like, as a player, you want blood. You decide <laughs> how you want blood. Do you want to beat someone up? Are you a va playing a vampire? Do you literally want blood? Do you want to find family? Like, what what is blood to you? And you're in this small, like, uh, Appalachian, like, snow retreat town for Christmas. And with that setup, you figure out like what what do you want? So building really big like smacking in the face themes yeah. has kind of been my my thing, my jam. And it's very cool. So <laughs> um yeah, so Phoebe mechanics, tell us tell us things. Yeah, for me, for choice of games, there, there is, there it is since it is entire, it is entirely text based. It does kind of, it does kind of limit some potential options. But then there's what you can do with text, because I can uh, every the because the game is split up into multiple pages, so many pages. Player does need to press a button to advance to the next one. But those button names can be uh, can be modified, so you can have uh, you can name essentially the way forward something that sparks like tension or concern or worry, or it's and it's also just part of the whole how it's similar to comics in that what I felt is in you want to have kind of a cliffhanger on every time before you turn the page and it's sort of a in this structure it there's a similar thing you want to have um like to leave something hanging like a question that should be answered or like like how are you like how are you going to resolve this choice is a common one but even for the ones that aren't choices it's like what does th this thing that just happened what does that mean or what does this per when this person said that, what did they mean? Or this person has been stabbed by has been stabbed by an invisible sword. What's going on? That sort of thing. I like so, that the setting setting up questions that people want to know. Yeah, so like the very the very like mini mini cliffhangers, so that they are like they can be resolved almost immediately. But then you just need to set up to do something else and just keep. It's not not escalating but just keeping uh keeping at a at a steady gallop mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah ali do you do you tend to have stakes like preset in the games in terms of like you have you'll have maybe like success metrics of some kind but or do you tend to prefer to let players kind of decide their own what success means it depends a lot on what i'm writing Mm -hmm. So for, uh, wait, hold on. <laughs> I think I've hit the NDA wall. Uh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean. <laughs> uh, but like for scenarios that I've written. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait, 
I know one thing that I can talk about. Uh, okay. But for scenarios that I've written, it's usually I've given you this sandbox. How you play in it is up to you. But know that the sandbox was made like this and it might collapse or like everything could fall apart. It just stay there. No matter what you do, it'll always go back to exactly the way it was before, which uh, is kind of the way the setup that I tried to imply for uh, another small town for Monster Hearts that I wrote called Sprawl Green that's based on where I went to high school, which is this tiny suburb that pretends that nothing has ever gone wrong, nothing ever will go wrong, nothing can go wrong here. And we're very diverse, actually. We have multiple kinds of families here. But really, it's it's definitely not. Uh, but for, for setting a pace for what you want to achieve as a character in Thirsty Sword Lesbians, or in Shinsei Galactic. Um, because I had to give people archetypes, because everyone loves wrestling the way I do, and I realized that. I tried to set up a potential story arc for a character. Uh, some of them are based on actual wrestlers. So there is one uh, based on Kenny Omega as the cleaner in his like best bout machine era mm -hmm. where I literally turned him into a robot with it pronouns and he's been made specifically to win every single match which in that world means that the corporation that he's wrestling for is gaining more and more power but sometimes it seems like this robot who should only want to win matches doesn't really want to win matches so hmm. you can figure out what's up with them and as a player playing that archetype it's okay so what do i want what do i as someone that should only want one thing actually want and all of those like archetypes that i wrote are built that way that is that is really cool because then like you said it's like they can either kind of play within the constraints that you've already set up or they can redefine those constraints in in their own way so that is really cool um and speaking of designing uh, these kinds of elements so um next question i have on deck is uh, what what challenges do you face um when trying to design these kind of feel inducing game elements ali you've already talked about like the challenge of kind of constraining the characters so they don't go way too far off what you want and um i know that phoebe for you you've got a lot of you know just sort of a rigidity to the structure as well um i actually actually i'll let phoebe go first and then ali for this one yeah, because it is a thing to, it is really dependent on what you're using to actually make the game. Like, I'm, I'm planning, I'm planning to look into Twine for future games. I know that does, uh, that does uh, support a lot, but it's not something I can really talk about yet because I've, I've only experienced it as a player, not a game putter together. But in terms of like using, because choice of games, games are written in choice script which is very straightforward forward and flexible, but there are certain things, like there are only so many things it's capable of and there are certain things that it can't do. So you do have to, like in terms of, uh, you, are, you are limited in how you're able to get these expressions of emotion across, but then that limitation does does provide an avenue of creativity to it just because there are so many things that exist because the creators were trying to just deal with the technical limitations that they had at hand yeah like you were describing before like having the kind of next page button say something leading or so, something like that yeah um, Ali, yeah, what kind of challenges, again, you've already described at least one of them, but what other challenges yeah. do you, you face when designing these these game elements to, to induce feels? Um, the biggest one is one, well, the biggest two are narrowing down my influences, because a lot of, I don't know when indie games started doing this, but putting in uh, points of reference, so like movies that you can watch, uh, 
music that you can listen to, books you can read, like media that you can consume to get in the mindset that mm -hmm. I was in when I was making the game. Mm -hmm. uh, the other big one is choosing the right words. And uh, I, I'm still not sure about the words that I chose, but for a game that I'm working on called Heist, you have four stats. Uh, fix, Fox, Fleece, and Frag. And I specifically wanted to go for alliteration because mm -hmm. it's based around action movies and heist movies. Mm -hmm. And alliteration just works really, really well, especially for like one syllable words. But then I had to find one syllable words that all started with the same letter <laughs> that conveyed being able to work with machines, outsmarting people, um, tricking people in some way uh plan uh planning and using weapons and like explosions your explosions set and those were the four that i hit on uh possibly i should have made different choices like not <laughs> starting with the letter f or constraining myself to a single syllable but in all the play tests that i've seen it's worked really really well Mm -hmm. to get people in the mindset of like what they can do with these stats and where they can take a character yeah no because yeah. they come in automatically with that flavor profile yeah go ahead phoebe yeah. sorry yeah i was just gonna say like because it's uh it helped just like as you said it really sets those sets those expectations because you can establish so establish so much about what you're trying to get across and what kind of world this is because like if you're cons if you're constraining the potential choices that a player can make based uh based on those skills then you can you can use that to like focus the emotional oomph to make it uh to make it even more stronger like the difference the difference between a hammer and a needle kind of it's like I was looking at the same sort of thing. Like one of the games that I want was looking at making and still want to do would be using basically like the three skills of wrenches, words, and wounds. Mm -hmm. For that, uh, just f because alliteration is cool, but just because it sets up the, it gives that the players the insight into what kind of what kind of world they're entering. Yeah, I think that's one thing Blaze does well too, is that it has just kind of very specific flavor in all of the descriptions for the different skills and, and attributes and stuff like that. Um, okay, I've got one more question and then we're gonna move on to the audience questions. Uh, so speaking of other games, uh, are, are there any games that you've played recently, uh, come to as a player, that you think do a good job of taking you on a particular emotional journey? I can jump in. Sure, go. Yeah. Okay, this is, I know, uh, it's, um, Fallout 4 for me, actually, which is, uh, something I hadn't expected before I started playing it, but, and I think, I know a lot of people have opinions about the game, and I do think that in this respect, a lot of it is what I am bringing to the game rather than what is in the game itself. And I feel like that is another critical thing for what we're for uh, what we're doing as game designers, having that space so that the players can project emotional states into them. Because part of the whole thing that got me emotionally invested with that with Fallout 4 was because it was the first time in, in that, that sort of game, it was the first time I felt like I was part of the world and not just passing through someone else's mm -hmm. world because like just think of like ever like the tra traditional like like going back like isometric rpgs and so on and, and so forth like you can um like you can make choices sure and like sometimes the world changes but it's only changes that and if you you only have effects that were anticipated and planned for you from the beginning. 
I feel like there's a lot more, you can get a lot more emotional investment from players when with the whole, with sandbox type things or just things that make it so that they can affect the world in ways that you did not map out for them. <laughs> it's a difference between the, these are, it's the difference between these are the things you will do and these are the things you can do. I think that can do is massively important for positive emotional reactions. That's a really good way of, of putting it. Yeah. Ali, any thoughts mm -hmm. on if, 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 yeah, or just any thoughts on what, what Phoebe was talking about in terms of sandboxing and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, well, first for sandboxing, yes, a really big thing, especially in tabletop, because it's almost always all a sandbox. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a more constrained sandbox, but generally just one big giant sandbox. You can't always account for what a player will try to do. Like uh, in one of my home games, which I talked about earlier in my tabletop mechanics workshop, in one of my home games, our GM, uh, Joshua Kim, who's also was talking here, uh, they made a mechanic where instead of making death saves, et cetera, et cetera, in D&D, &D, when you are downed, mm -hmm. you, you die immediately. You gain plus one in one stat and minus one in another stat. Yike. Which is really interesting because you have, you should have this tight rope of, okay, I can make myself the best possible, like, cleric or bard or whatever I can be. But if anything happens and I ever have to, like, make a strength check, I might just be gone because if I hit zero, it's over. Ooh. But one player in our campaign... <laughs> Uh, decided I can just min-max for free. Uh, put his plus ones all into one stat for his highest, best, like, mechanical roll. All his minus ones in the second highest stat to maximize the plus ones that he could have. Just made this incredibly powerful character. And we were all there, just sitting there like, you, you're going to fall apart. You have one strength. Not not a one modifier for strength. Just one. One. Just one. <laughs> oh. So like you can never really predict what people will do, but leaving the opening for what they can do can make for an experience like that. And because then, then how uh, do you play how do you RP a character with one strength? Yikes. Yeah. And it was just that he was incredibly bombastic as a as a warlock. So super high charisma. Just keep faking it until you make it and hope no one punches you. And if they do, sure you go down immediately. But you'll come up and hopefully you have any strength points left. Oh my gosh. That is an amazing like game hack. <laughs> like yeah. holy and, cow. Uh, favorite games? Uh I play a lot of Apex Legends and I love the stories within the barks. Which is really weird, but like they've told the entire story of uh, a character who ends up becoming a thief and the eternal robot assassin who killed her entire family and set her on that path through barks in a comic. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is wild. And that's yeah. the kind of a cool thing that you can do in video games, too, is just have those side things. All right, um, since we only have a few minutes left, I'm going to move to audience questions. And so um, we actually just kind of answered the first one about games that you think, uh, the, I'll read the question anyway. Uh, what's a game you think utterly aced the emotional response from you? What's one that failed, but in a good way? Um, and so maybe that second part of that question is one that we, we can talk about. Can you think of any games that failed to elicit the desired emotional response, but were still kind of maybe interesting to you somehow? Or succeed uh, in some other metric? For me, it was probably Skyrim. Um, hmm. There were just too many things that could happen that I didn't know what I wanted to try to do. And when I did things, I did feel like I was going through someone else's story. Hmm. And occasionally I would hit something where I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then I forget where it was because this world is just too big and there was too much. And it was, for me, too much of a sandbox. 
like thinking about that, I feel like not to not to keep going in the same. Sorry, but I tend to keep going in the same direction. But Fallout seventy six. Because I think that really did fail on that kind of emotional investment because it is like the way it is built from the beginning is like I don't even know what kind of emotion Bethesda was trying to go for it, go with for it, but it's just the the mechanics of the game are structured in such a way that it it does like the whole there is a massive i feel like there is a massive ludo narrative dissonance in that mm-hmm. game mm-hmm. and it really it like really brings out the what's the point emotion like there's got to be a name for that that i'm just not thinking of but mm-hmm. it's just i i can see a lot of things it was trying to do and it just failed so much just because of just because of the way it was built and how it has the it's caught between the demands of having this having this game narrative but also being essentially an mmo mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we will call it ludo narrative on we <laughs> yeah. yeah it being kind of like an mmo but not is really interesting to me because mm-hmm. i love final fantasy 14 mm. and uh Part of that game incredibly failed with emotional resonance and part of it was wonderfully and beautifully constructed. I'm talking about uh, 2.x, A Rum Reborn, fails utterly at emotional resonance. (laughs) And then you get to Shadowbringers in 5.x and it's just this wonderful story about like heroes and villains and all of like are you truly a hero or are you just someone else's villain? Mm -hmm. And like, like giving, making compromises as a character, which both you and the villains do. And it's this whole like set of parallels. There's a lot of black and white imagery in it. It's really, really good. Uh, Play Shadowbringers. All right. We do have one more question, which we may not have enough time to answer. And so yeah. if you want to head over to the Discord for it, it is, I'm going to say it out yeah. loud just so you know. And then if you have one or two quick responses to it, uh, what are some good resources, tools, or exercises you use for inspiration when you can't capture the emotion you're trying to convey? Yeah, I think that would be um, a good one for me to think about and answer mm-hmm. on the Discord. Cool. Because they uh, do want us to, they do want us to. To wrap at 50. Yep, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. All uh, right. I will drop one thing. Yep. Netflix Blinge. Ooh, yes. Just yeah. go and watch a bunch of stuff. Or make a playlist. I mean, you already or got Or make that. a playlist, yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. Um, so, yeah, we have two minutes left. So I'm going to ask our awesome panelists to once again introduce themselves and say where they could be found on social media. Uh, we'll start with Allie. Yep. Uh, hi. I've, I've been Allie Bushton. I'll probably continue to be Allie Bushton. What uh, else? <laughs> On the internet, you can find me on Twitter at M-A-D-P-I-E-R-R-O-T. Uh, my website is madperro.design, spelled the same way. And on Itch, where you can find my tabletop games and eventually the ink game that I'll hopefully finish one day if I ever stop getting enough <laughs> freelance. Uh, or hopefully don't suck freelance. <laughs> it's also madpro.itch.io. Awesome. Thank you. Phoebe. Hi. Right, so yeah, I'm uh, Phoebe Barton, uh, trans, queer, writer, game developer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, uh, at a Phoebe Barton and at phoebebartonsf.com. And at this point, like I just like I would really like to write another game because and I would really like to take less than two years to do it. <laughs> I believe in you, Phoebe. You will make it happen. 
Uh, I have been your host, Valerie Valdez. You can find me on Twitter at Valerie Valdez. That's with an S if you're listening and not watching. And we are once again in Toast A on the Discord, so you can find us there. Thank you so much uh, to my lovely panelists, Ellie and Phoebe. That was an amazing panel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we will be in the Discord and see you around the convention, I hope. And thank you so much to everyone who joined us. Thank you for your questions. And I hope you have a lovely evening or day or I don't know what time zone it is for everyone, but <laughs> thank you so much for coming and thank you again. All right, meeting adjourned. I will be now ending it. Thank you. Thank you.